welcome to the TCEQ's PST Compliance Webinar, How to Prepare for a UST Investigation. My name is Shelley Nike, and I'll be your moderator today. We are still in the process of mailing printed copies of the UST Compliance Notebook to everyone who registered for one of our webinars. If you've not received your copy by August 31st, email us at psthelp at tceq.texas.gov so we can resend one to you. Please take a moment to click on the attendance form posted in the live event Q&A on the right side of the screen and fill it in for us. If you don't see the Q&A, you can turn it on by clicking the question mark icon on the top right of the screen. Only our presenters will be, will be able to speak at today's webinar, but you can use the Q&A to ask a question at any time. We will do our best to answer your questions in the Q&A and after each of our presenters. We have two presenters today. Rebecca Stanish and Becky Costigan, both with our Small Business and Local Government Assistance section. We will take a 10 minute break between presenters and will remain online during the break to respond to some of the questions in the Q&A. And now I will turn over the mic to Rebecca Stanish. Thank you, Shelley. And hello everyone. Thanks for joining us to learn about how to prepare for an underground storage tank investigation. We're glad you've joined us for this webinar today. And now we have traditionally given this presentation at small workshops across the state of about 50 people or less. But now that we've gone remote, we have over 900 people registered across these four webinars. And we're so happy to be able to get this information to so many more of you virtually. As Shelley mentioned, I am Rebecca Stanish and I work in the Small Business and Local Government Assistance or SBLGA section at the TCEQ Central Office in Austin. My co-presenter is Becky Costigan with SBLGA in the Houston Regional Office. And our section of the TCEQ has a compliance specialist in almost every area of the state that can help you with your questions about environmental rules. If you have questions during this webinar, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A panel on the right side of the screen. Since participant microphones and webcams will not be available to you during the event, the Q&A panel is the only way that you can ask questions. Your questions will be moderated throughout the webinar. Please note that not all questions will be published for everyone to view, but questions that are not addressed during the webinar will be reviewed and answered in a frequently asked questions document that will be posted on our PST Compliance Resources webpage, and a link to that uh, question and answer document will be emailed to you after the last webinar on August 13th. For site-specific questions, we encourage you to email us at psthelp at tceq.texas.gov or call our toll-free hotline number 1-800-447-2827. So here's an overview of what we'll discuss today. We're going to go over the investigation process and the different checklists that can be used during an investigation. We'll talk about who we are here in the SBLGA section, and we will go over the contents of the UST Compliance Notebook, which has examples of records that are needed to show compliance. In the middle of this webinar, we will answer some questions and take a short break um, before we switch presenters, and then we will finish going through the notebook and we'll end by talking about how to request records from the TCEQ. And so just a little bit of background information first off about the Energy Act of 2005. This act requires all states to inspect all underground storage tanks every three years. And there are over 21,000 underground storage tank facilities in Texas, meaning that the TCEQ and its contractors are required to do about 7,000 inspections each year. And we've seen a lot of violations as a result of these inspections. In fiscal year 2019, we had over 338 orders filed against PST facilities with an average penalty of about $7,400. And we'd really like to see these numbers reduced. 
you would be much better off if you take some time now to make sure your facility is in compliance before the investigation occurs. Now, there are three different compliance checklists that an investigator could use during an inspection. The first is the Energy Act checklist, and this is a focused 10-point checklist. And because it's focused, it only hits the high points in the rules. But you do need to make sure that your facility is in compliance with all of the rules and not just those on the Energy Act checklist because the investigator could instead use the CEI mod or Modified Compliance Evaluation Investigation checklist. This is a longer checklist. It has about 40 points. It's more in depth than the Energy Act checklist. And we also have a checklist specifically for temporarily out of service tanks. You have to be ready for any checklist that applies to you at any time. These checklists are available on our PST Compliance Resources webpage, which we will talk more about shortly. And again, your best option is to be in compliance before the investigation, and we can help you do that. So investigations can be either announced or unannounced. If it's announced, you'll normally get between one to two weeks notice, and the investigation will consist of a records review and an on-site inspection. The investigator may request records when they announce the investigation, or they may ask that you have them available on site. If the TCEQ receives a complaint regarding your facility, complaint investigations are required to be conducted unannounced and the TCEQ is required to investigate complaints within 30 days of receiving the complaint. So the possibility of having an investigator show up with no notice given is just another reason why your best option is to be in compliance before the investigation occurs. So after an investigation, if violations are found, the investigator will give you an exit interview form describing the issues. Violations are classified into categories A, B, and C. Category A violations are the most severe in terms of their threat to human health or the environment. And category C violations are usually cited for partial non-compliances. Depending on the severity of the violations that are noted, you may receive a notice of enforcement or a notice of violation. And the difference between those are, notices of enforcement are referred to the enforcement division and are assessed a penalty. You could receive a field citation and these are only issued for certain category A violations. There are a few benefits of field citations over formal enforcement. With field citations, it is a quicker process and there is a reduced penalty. If any violations are noted, you are required to get into compliance and submit compliance documentation as soon as possible because this could reduce your penalty. Now, speaking of the penalty, we are often asked how much that penalty will be, but unfortunately we don't know because that penalty is calculated by the enforcement coordinator that's assigned to your case, and several different factors go into their penalty calculations. They will consider the amount of throughput or how much product is dispensed on average. They'll consider your compliance history, and they'll also consider any avoided costs. This is money that you saved by not complying with a rule. For example, if you failed to have the required testing done, the money that you saved by not paying for the test would be an avoided cost. The enforcement coordinator will also consider whether you came into compliance quickly, which is the good faith reduction. And this is why it's best that you fix the problem and submit your compliance documentation as soon as possible. There's also a deferral for agreeing to an order, and that gets factored into the penalty calculation as well. 
So here's some information about what our section of the TCEQ does. The SBLGA program offers confidential compliance assistance without the threat of enforcement. We develop guidance documents like the UST Compliance Notebook. Our webpage is texasenvirohelp.org, and this site has lots of good information that's multimedia, and that means it pertains to air quality, water quality, and waste regulations. We have an Enviro Mentor program as well, and this program is for small facilities that can't afford an environmental consultant. We can set them up with one of our environmentors, and these are volunteer professionals that help these facilities to resolve specific technical issues. We also have this toll-free hotline number. During all agency business hours, you can call the SBLGA hotline with your questions about environmental rules. And we also have the advocate. This is a free email newsletter that provides information on rule changes and upcoming events or webinars like this one. You can subscribe on our website or contact us and we can help to sign you up. Some of our resources that are specific to PST or petroleum storage tanks are the PST Super Guide, or RG-475, which is available online. You can access a specific module or the entire document. And the Super Guide is a plain language technical guide to the PST rules. I highly recommend reading the Super Guide because it includes a lot of really good information that's not covered in this workshop, which is geared towards the record keeping. And if you have any questions after this webinar, there's a good chance that the answers can be found in the PST Super Guide. As I mentioned, we also have a Petroleum Storage Tanks Compliance Resources webpage, and you can find that webpage off of our main TCEQ website, which is tceq.texasspelledout.gov by searching PST Compliance Resources in the search box in the upper right-hand corner. On this webpage, we have tools, guidance documents, and those compliance checklists that we mentioned earlier. Another good resource that's posted on this webpage is an updated rule summary that goes over the new PST rules that became effective in May of 2018. And we also have the UST Compliance Notebook, which we will be going over today. So the UST Compliance Notebook is a record keeping tool to help ensure that you have the required records readily available at your site. It includes example records to help you know what the investigators are looking for, and it also has blank log sheets that you can use. This notebook can also serve as a place to put your necessary records. You should put this in a three ring binder and keep it at your facility so that all your records will be readily available when the time comes for your facility to be inspected. So let's dive into the notebook. The first page is the instructions page, which shows the general rule citations where this guidance comes from. And page two has some more specific rule citations. The official rules are found in Title 30 of the Texas Administrative Code. Chapter 334 contains most of the PST rules, but there are also these other chapters on financial assurance and vapor recovery. In general, you need to keep records for five years or as long as the equipment is in use. It's important to keep the installation records for the lifetime of your system. That original installation documentation is valuable and it can be very difficult to replace those records if they are lost. And so there is a different section of the notebook with example records for each of these requirements, self-certification and registration, financial assurance, corrosion protection, release detection, and so on. And here are some other sections of the notebook, um, miscellaneous records, 
Texas Department of Agriculture, which the TCEQ may check some of those requirements. We'll be covering that later. Um, a lot of interesting different sections that we'll be going through today. And as we go through each of these topics, we will first discuss what the requirements are, and then we'll talk about what records you need to have to prove compliance with the rules. And so now we'll go through the notebook and discuss the records needed for each section. And we'll start with the first section, self-certification and registration. So what are the requirements? All underground storage tanks that contain or have contained a regulated substance must be registered with the TCEQ. And all underground storage tanks that contain motor fuel are required to self-certify every year. If there are any changes to the system, such as a change of ownership or tank status, or switching release detection methods, for example, those changes are required to be reported within 30 days. It's also very important to keep your contact information updated because the information on your registration is what the investigators will use to notify you of a scheduled investigation. And if your contact information isn't up to date, you may not get that notification. You can update your contact information using the self-certification form that we'll talk more about shortly. Now you can use STEERS, which is the TCEQ's online electronic permitting and reporting system to renew your self-certification as long as there have been no owner or operator changes. You cannot use STEERS for initial self-certifications. You can also use STEERS to submit construction notifications electronically or you can also use the paper construction notification form, which is form number 00495. We have a guidance document, which is RG531A, that will take you through step-by-step -step on how to create a STEERS account. So I highly recommend if you are looking at creating a STEERS account, um, download the RG531A, it's really great and it has screenshots and I'll take you through step by step. And if you want to submit your self-certification renewal online, you have two options. The first is to create a new STEERS account by following that guidance RG531A, or if you already have an account, the second option is to add PST to your existing STEERS account, then submit paper proof of financial assurance wait five days, and then self-certify in STEERS. Some benefits of using STEERS to renew your self-certifications are, you can get your delivery certificate the same day, avoid the paperwork, and you can self-certify at multiple facilities in less time. So you will need to keep copies of all registration and self-certification forms submitted within the past five years. You need to keep a copy of your current registration certificate and a copy of your current delivery certificate. The delivery certificate is what is issued after you submit your annual self-certification form and it is required to be visibly posted at your facility. If applicable, keep a record of your temporary delivery authorization. This would apply if you have a new system or if you're bringing tanks that were out of service back into service. You can get a temporary delivery authorization, which is good for 90 days from the first delivery. One important note is that tanks and compartments are required to be physically numbered on site and the numbering that's on site is required to match the numbering that's on your registration. These labels are required to be legible and permanent and sometimes people use spray paint and that's okay but since it must be permanent make sure you, you reapply that spray paint as the paint fades. Here's a photo showing uh, tank one numbered on site. And for compartmental tanks, 
label the compartments to match your registration, and people usually register compartmental tanks as compartment 2A, for example. And here's a, another picture of compartment 2B. In the notebook, there's a copy of the registration and self-certification form, which is form number 0724. And the notebook also has an example delivery certificate. Again, make sure your delivery certificate is up to date and clearly posted at your facility. In the notebook, there's also an example temporary delivery authorization letter. Moving on to the financial assurance section of the notebook, this is where you can keep all of your financial assurance records. So you are required to have enough financial assurance to cover corrective action, which is the cleanup of a release, and to cover third party liability. This is bodily injury and property damage caused by a release or an accident. The most common amounts of financial assurance that are required are $1 million per occurrence and $1 million aggregate. An aggregate means the total amount required for all leaks that might occur within one year. Please note that these coverage amounts are the most common amounts required, but depending on the type of facility and the throughput, the rules may require different minimum coverage amounts. And you can contact us and we can help you look through the rules to determine the amount of financial assurance that's required for your facility. The most common type of financial assurance is an insurance policy, but other forms of acceptable financial assurance include a letter of credit, a surety bond, self-insurance, or a financial test. So you will need to keep records of your current certificate of insurance or your other proof of financial assurance, such as a letter of credit. You are required to submit a copy of your current financial assurance along with your annual self-certification form. Otherwise, you won't receive a delivery certificate and you are not allowed to get fuel deliveries without a valid delivery certificate. In the notebook, there is an example certificate of insurance and the investigator will want to see the endorsement page for the tanks that are covered by your policy. Moving on to the corrosion protection requirements. Underground storage tank systems are required to be protected from corrosion so they don't end up like the tanks in this photo here. The corrosion protection requirements depend on the material of the tanks and piping. One way to comply with these rules is to have non-corrodible tanks constructed of fiberglass reinforced plastic or FRP. Now, steel tanks on the other hand are corrodible, so they need to have a cathodic protection system installed on them. The requirements for corrosion protection are to protect all underground and underwater metal components from corrosion. You must test all cathodic protection systems at installation three to six months after the installation and again every three years after that. If you have an impressed current system, which is a particular type of cathodic protection system, you need to read the rectifier every 60 days. So for cathodic protection systems, you will need to keep records of your initial cathodic protection system testing, again at installation and three to six months later, and also keep records of your three-year test results. If you have an impressed current system, keep a log of your 60-day rectifier inspections. For fiberglass tanks and piping and composite clad or jacketed tanks, the construction material is what dictates the, the requirements for corrosion protection. So you need to have records to prove the construction material and show that these components meet the corrosion protection requirements. The records that you will need to have may include 
or you may prove this by visual proof, um, but that's usually not possible. So if you're not able to visually prove the construction material of your tanks or piping, you will need to have records of your installation of those components. Um, or if you don't have the installation records, you will need to have a written statement from a corrosion specialist certifying that the tank or piping meets the corrosion protection requirements. So this slide applies if you have metal components that are protected with the impressed current system. Another record to keep in this section of the notebook are your 60-day rectifier inspection logs. Here's an example log, and there is also a blank log sheet in the notebook that you can use to keep these records if you would like. The rectifier is required to always be turned on, and when you're taking these readings, you'll want to ensure that the amps and volts are close to what the system was designed for, as shown on your most recent cathodic protection test. And if you see any abnormalities in these readings, you will need to contact a corrosion specialist to evaluate your system. So the records that you will need to keep include for composite clad or jacketed steel tanks. Make sure you either have installation records, meaning an original invoice for the tanks, or a written statement from a corrosion specialist certifying that your tank meets the corrosion protection requirements. So let's talk about sumps for a minute. This example shows two different contained sumps where the pump is pr protected from the surrounding backfill by a plastic containment structure. And the rules say that any metal component that comes in contact with backfill soil or water needs to be protected from corrosion. Corrosion protection can be achieved by isolating the component from soil and water. So in the photo on the right, these metal components are considered to be electrically isolated because they are not in contact with soil or water. You are required to keep these sumps clean and dry in order to meet the corrosion protection requirements by isolation. But in the photo on the left, you can see that those metal components are not isolated because the sump is filled with water. And in other cases where the sumps are not contained, where the metal components are completely surrounded by backfill, those would also not be isolated. And so if you cannot keep the metal components from coming into contact with backfill or water, your system needs to have some other form of corrosion protection, like installing a cathodic protection system to protect those non-isolated metal components. Here is a photo of an inside of a fiberglass reinforced plastic or FRP tank. And this camera survey was done to show visual proof of these FRP ribs as documentation of the tank material. And the arrows on this slide are pointing to the FRP ribs. Now let's talk about tank release detection. All tanks in Texas are required to be monitored for leaks every 30 days. This means you cannot go more than 30 days between passing test results. And there are several different approved methods of release detection, but no matter which method you use, it must be able to detect a release of 0.2 gallons per hour, and it must be conducted in accordance with the third-party certification for that method of release detection. You can look up third-party certifications at this website, nwglde.org, and that stands for the National Work Group on Leak Detection Evaluations. So, you are required to conduct your first 30-day walkthrough inspection of your release detection equipment by January 1st, 2021. And this walkthrough inspection includes checking and testing your alarms, 
and reviewing your release detection records and inventory control records. This is one of the newer rules from 2018. For more information, please see the updated rule summary that's posted on our PST Compliance Resources webpage. Another requirement is by January 1st, 2021, you must conduct your first annual walkthrough inspection of your handheld release detection equipment. This is another new rule from 2018. So this annual walkthrough inspection includes checking all of your handheld release detection equipment for operability. And this may include tank gauge sticks or groundwater balers, depending on the method of release detection that you use. Also, by January 1st, 2021, you are required to conduct your first annual test of your release detection equipment. This includes testing for proper operation, your ATG or automatic tank gauge and controllers, alarms, battery backup, your annual line leak detector or ALLD, probes and sensors, vacuum pumps and pressure gauges. And you're also required to keep all of these records for five years. So the records that you will need to keep for release detection. We are going to start with two common methods of release detection. And the first is automatic tank gauging or ATG with inventory control. If you use ATG with inventory control as your release detection method, you need to have a record of at least one passing ATG test every 30 days. So these release detection tests again need to be conducted within 30 days of the previous passing test. And you also need to have records of your inventory control with reconciliation. Now there is an exception in the rules only for used oil tanks and emergency generator tanks. These tanks can use ATG without inventory control, but again, that's only for used oil tanks and emergency generator tanks. Another common method of release detection is statistical inventory reconciliation or SIR with inventory control. If you use this as your release detection method, you need to keep records of your results from your SIR vendor. Again, passing results no more than 30 days apart. And you need to make sure that those results are received within 15 days of the 30 day monitoring period. Also keep your inventory control records for that method. So both ATG and SIR are not standalone methods, and that means each of them has to be paired with inventory control in order to be a valid method of release detection. Another important note is that inventory control is required no matter what if you are a retail facility. So if you sell gas, you are required to do inventory control with the 30 day reconciliation, no matter what form of release detection you're using. So the notebook includes examples of ATG tests. The investigators are looking for passing tests no more than 30 days from the previous passing test. So these example records on this slide are included in the notebook. And it's important to note that the two ATG tapes that are shown on top would not be sufficient to show compliance because they say 0.2 gallon per hour test invalid, low level test error, percent volume too low. And the ones at the bottom are acceptable records of passing 0.2 gallon per hour tests. In the notebook, there is an example 30 day inventory control record, and there is also a blank form in the notebook that you can use. These forms were taken from the EPA's guidance doing inventory control right, which is posted on our PST compliance resources webpage. However, please note that the 2018 rule changes changed 
the release detection requirements from monthly to 30 days, and that applies to inventory control. And so we have modified the EPA's inventory control logs that we have included in the compliance notebook to be 30 days instead of the old monthly requirement. And the reconciliation portion is at the bottom of the inventory control form, and this is also called the leak check. It's important to note that if your inventory control fails the leak check for two months in a row, you need to report this as a suspected release. And Becky will be telling you more about suspected releases in the second half of this webinar. So the notebook also has a daily inventory worksheet. This was taken directly from that EPA guidance as well. And you can use this worksheet if you are reading the totalizers to figure out the amounts of fuel that's pumped. The notebook also has an example of SIR results. And in this example, the test record actually says fail inconclusive, must fill out suspected release form and research problem. So this test record would not be sufficient to show compliance for the premium tank because it is not a passing test. This would need to be reported to TCEQ. And again, Becky will talk more about reporting suspected releases during the second half. So another method of release detection is interstitial monitoring, and this monitors the interstitial space between double walled tanks or piping for releases. If you use interstitial monitoring, keep records or log sheets showing the status of each sensor, and the status should be normal at least once every 30 days on those records. If you use groundwater or vapor monitoring, Keep a record of a statement from the well installer showing that a release will be detected in at least 30 days. And also keep records of your 30 day results from the monitoring well. In the notebook, there is a blank interstitial monitoring log that you can use to keep records of your 30 day monitoring results. This is an optional form, you're not required to use it, but you can use it if it will help you with your record keeping. The notebook also has blank groundwater and vapor monitoring logs. And some more release detection methods include 30 day tank gauging. Now this is only an option for tanks that are associated with emergency generators. But if you have an emergency generator and you're using 30 day tank gauging as your release detection method, make sure you keep records showing your 30 day monitoring results. If you monitor secondary containment barriers for releases, you need to have records of your 30, 30 day monitoring results as well. And another method is manual tank gauging. This is only an option for tanks that are 1000 gallons or less. If you use manual tank gauging, keep records showing your periodic monitoring results. And these records actually include weekly and monthly measurements, and we will see that on the example record shortly. So in the notebook, we have a blank 30-day tank gauging table. We also have a blank secondary containment barrier monitoring log. And the notebook also has a blank manual tank gauging log. Again, this is for tanks that are 1,000 gallons or less. And you can see on this, on the right, or there's the monthly standard and weekly standards on this log. And also keep records for those 2018 release detection requirements. And that includes keeping records of your 30 day walkthrough inspections, your annual walkthrough inspections, and your annual test records for release detection equipment. The notebook has an example walkthrough inspection log. 
And this is a blank log that you can use to help make sure you capture all of the requirements for walkthrough inspections that are listed in the rules. Make sure you capture those in your records. And the notebook also has an annual testing log. And so just a reminder to keep all of your records on a five year basis and keep your installation records for the lifetime of your system. And by now you've probably realized that the name of the game is record keeping. Now that you have this notebook to help, you can get a three ring binder and start making sure that you have all of the records needed to pass an inspection. We are always willing to help with any questions that you have. Please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A panel or call our hotline or email us at this PST help email address. Don't forget our regional SBLGA staff and our Texas Enviro Help webpage are also resources for you. And with that, I'll turn things back over to our moderator to see if we have any questions. Shelly? Yeah, 